Hello and welcome to another episode of The Defenders on Sunset TV. And in this episode, we are looking at something slightly outside the Indian subcontinent, but very much a matter of interest to India. And that is the expanding role of the Indian Navy and India's strategic interests in the ASEAN region, particularly the South China Sea, to counter China's strong footprint there. And to that effect, we have two hands-on practitioners of geopolitics and more specifically India's diplomacy in Southeast Asia. We have with us Ambassador Jitender Mishra, who has not only served in Vietnam and thereafter held ambassadorial appointments elsewhere in Europe also, but speaks Vietnamese. And therefore, he'll be able to help us understand the Vietnamese mindset, as well as we have Professor Hashpant, a regular on media channels and his commentaries in the print media, Professor of War Studies from King's College London and now affiliated with ORF in Delhi also. And I'll start with you, Ambassador Mishra, sir. It has been said that most recently India has signed this arrangement with Vietnam. It seems to be possibly one of the first major arrangements and an agreement that India has entered into. And the scope and scale of the defense ties that would last at least to 2030 or beyond certainly gives us an understanding that India is not going to be waiting only for the American lead to act in a maritime zone where India's influence and capabilities of its navies can be quite effective, and that is the South China Sea. Your views, sir. Thank you very much, Maru, for inviting me on your show. There are two aspects to it. One is the Roadmap 2030. Now, that's unusual because Vietnam, as far as I know, it has a similar arrangements with other countries, but uh, not for such a long time. It's, it's virtually a 10 years agreement, a roadmap. So they are looking at the relationship with India hmm. in a strategic way hmm. going forward, hmm. because it's not just uh, in the immediate future. Hmm. The other aspect is the logistics agreement. Hmm. Now, why it is important is because it is the first agreement of its kind that Vietnam has signed with any country. Now, Vietnam has three comprehensive strategic partnership partners, the Russian Union, China, and then India being the third. These are the three most privileged countries as partners in Vietnam's scheme of things, at least on paper. But what it does is that India seems to have overtaken, at least at the symbolic, if not the substantive level, both the Russian Federation, as well as China, in being the first country with which Vietnam has signed a logistics agreement. It's not the first for India. We have about six, uh, the US, Australia, Japan, and others. But uh, it's very significant because it will definitely give us a greater, I don't know how much greater, but a greater degree of access to Vietnamese naval facilities within Vietnam and near Vietnam, perhaps, to deploy when we need to. Very nice, sir. Very comprehensive. And that's a good sort of curtain raiser. Uh, Professor Harshpan, sir, uh, just in that area, you have on 8th of June, the Cambodians and the Chinese have signed a Beijing-funded extension of the Riem Naval Base in Cambodia, which means that here is another toehold that Beijing has in and around the South China Sea, which I would like to think that Beijing is not going to let up despite all sorts of comments, resolutions and uh, joint statements being passed about Beijing's aggressive intent in that area. So is the arrangement with Vietnam at least something more substantially moving forward to counter Beijing? or it is part of the overall agenda of the American-led initiatives in the Indo-Pacific? Maruf, I think we are moving away from the US-led security order in, 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 in that part of the world. And I think what is interesting is, is that um, ASEAN is heavily divided now. Uh, and uh, for a long time, we have been saying that, look, ASEAN centrality is key 
to not only India's vision of the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. but also for many other countries. So all the Quad members, for example, uh, Japan, Australia and the US have, have talked about ASEAN centrality. Now, the problem there is that ASEAN, is, as we have been discussing, you know, you have India's logistics agreement and other agreements with Vietnam, Cambodia coming in big way, China coming in a big way via Cambodia. And China has already consolidated its presence in South China Sea. We know through artificial uh, islands construction and the way it has positioned its military infrastructure in those islands. So I think clearly we are seeing a militarization and a, uh, of the region, of that maritime space, but also the divisions coming out into, into the open. That countries like Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia taking very overtly anti-China position. Whereas you have Cambodia, Laos, you know, uh, taking relatively moderate and moving in, in the, in the uh, Chinese orbit. What it would do to ASEAN, we don't know. But clearly, I think the pressure on ASEAN is, is palpable. Because ASEAN, for a very long time, had relied on this assumption that they can go with the Americans on security and with the Chinese on economic uh, prosperity. That fundamental assumption is breaking down as the contestation between US and China is getting amplified. So I think the, the point here for, for India is what opportunities are there for India. And I think Vietnam is a great opportunity, which India has taken by the, almost um, by the horns and moved forward on, on, on that front. But also I think uh, India last year, for example, uh, sailed, Indian Navy sailed in the, in the South China Sea. Now for India, South China Sea is very important, not only because of its centrality in the Indo-Pacific, but also more than 55% of our trade traverses through, Indo uh, through, through South yeah. China Sea. So I think the waters are, are, are becoming very important and we want stability there. We want prosperity and stability to move forward, uh, uh, you know, parallelly. And I think that challenge for India, how do you maintain that, that, uh, that peace and prosperity and stability in that part of the world, as well as what can you do to project your power at a time when major powers are competing and contesting in that, I think makes, makes ASEAN members very, very important and individual ASEAN countries like Vietnam very important for India. And to that effect, the role of the Indian Navy is central. Uh, it is really the service that is going to help us in power projection much more, I believe, than the other two services with no disrespect to the Army, which I belong to, and the Air Force. Uh, but Ambassador Mishra, sir, uh, officials have said that the joint vision plan between India and Vietnam calls for a significant amount of development and defense ties in a variety of areas. And you seem to have an understanding of the joint vision plan. What are these areas of cooperation or is it only to position us as a counter to China's uh, reach and China's footprint in that region, which is now fairly consolidated. Thank you. Uh, I think the two points are related. Uh, positioning is also augmenting capacities at a bilateral level. Um, what it does is uh, there is a major bright spot in the relationship as far as delivery of promises is concerned by India. As you know, the uh, 12 guard boats have been handed over in a formal ceremony by Raksha Mantri to his Vietnamese counterparts uh, during his visit just the other week. Now, five of these boats were manufactured in India and seven were manufactured in the Hong Ha shipyard in uh, Haiphong. Okay. Now, this is very unusual because India is not only transferring equipment Mm. and equipment that can make some difference mm. to Vietnam's claims mm. on Vietnam's side in the South China Sea disputes, but also allowing Vietnam access to a certain amount of technology because you can't just put the nuts and bolts together and just put everything together. Mm. You have to transfer some technology. So this is uh, something very unusual because our partners don't do that with us. They just want to sell. Uh, like the U.S. and others. But here uh, it shows a tremendous uh, level of trust, in my opinion, and a genuine desire on India's part uh, to really augment Vietnam's uh, own capacity in the strategic arena. And of course, there is uh, training, uh, the SU-30 and the Kilo class uh, submarines uh, that has been going on. <coughs> um, and uh, of course, visits have been going on uh, Haiphong, um, even Cameron Bay and uh, Nachang 
And of course, Saigon, when I was there, uh, we had lots of visits. And it was great because Vietnamese absolutely loved that. And I can tell you that Vietnamese friends used to say, one professor told me, you know what, today is the Chinese National Day. And I got this invitation. I didn't want to go there. I wanted to come here. So that was the kind of thinking and a hope within the Vietnamese mind um, <coughs> at the level of intellectual, certainly, that can India do something to contain China in this region. And that's what these agreements, uh, this roadmap uh, is all about. And of course, we have the uh, imaging center. In, we don't talk a lot about it, but uh, it is in the public domain, the imaging center, the satellite pictures uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. That's tremendously important because we will be transferring these pictures under the agreement that right. Israel signed, right. transferring to the Vietnamese. We will operate it but we will share. Now, we will also have access so we can jointly and individually look at what's moving or not moving in the South China Sea, including Thanks. dark shipping. It's a, I think this is another force multiplier. And then the showing the flag, the visits, the training. There's been jungle warfare training in India, in our Northeast also, as you know. So there is a broad spectrum of the relationship. But uh, Professor Pant, I want to understand this in the South China Sea, there is another aspect and that is that you talked about trade, but there is also oil exploration. And this is another area where India is been looking to arrangements with Vietnam and China and Vietnam have been in a sort of diplomatic confrontation about how much is Vietnam's waters and where do the oil wells lie. So there is that geostrategic context. Now, in such a context, do you see a greater involvement of the Indian Navy in support of Vietnam's, uh, what I would say, geo-economic agenda? Uh, Maruf, I would say this, you know, India took a position as far back as 2011, mm. uh, when India went in for uh, one of the oil exploration blocks in Vietnam. Mm. And that was a time when Chinese actually uh, came out and said, uh, well, this is not uh, Vietnamese territory. And India decided to take Vietnam's side and said that, look, uh, we, we are siding with Vietnam. We go with Vietnam's interpretation of what those, uh, mm. what these, uh, you know, what these waters suggest. Mm. So I think India has already, in, in, a, in a symbolic way, sided with Vietnam on, on those projects. Mm. Now, I think some of those projects have not been going as per the expectations were in, in 2011 mm. or 2012. Uh, but I think the, the idea that India will stand up, and I think the, at that point in time, it was, it was widely debated whether Indian Navy uh, will have the reach uh, to, uh, to uh, maintain and to protect Indian interests. Mm. And now, as, as, we, as, as we are sitting here in 2022, and last year, Indian Navy doing these exercises in, in South China Sea, Indian Navy has made it very clear that they do have the operational reach, and they have this vision to interact with friendly navies in the region to enhance the capacities in, the, in, in South China Sea, as Ambassador was talking about, uh, uh, in particular with Vietnam, but I think also to a, in a large part with other like-minded countries. So I think when we are talking of, of uh, engaging with countries like Japan uh, or uh, Australia, even in the context of Malabar, uh, we are looking at the wider expanse of the Indo-Pacific in which South China Sea plays such an important role. Because unless we can manage South China Sea, unless Indian Navy and other like-minded navies can manage the turmoil in South China Sea, the whole logic of Indo-Pacific falls apart because that's the right at the heart of the Indo-Pacific. So I think what we are witnessing now is an increasing assertion by Indian Navy, this idea that we are present and we want to help uh, uh, other uh, countries build, uh, uh, in, in building capacities, but also in making our operational presence felt, which is so important in the context of what Chinese are doing uh, in, in South China Sea. But I think the larger point here is also about how ASEAN members are increasingly, and some of them in particular, are looking for a country like India to come in and make its presence felt. And I think with Vietnam in particular, this comes out very categorically. But you also see, see that in the context of Indonesia, Philippines and, and uh, you know, Brahmos actually, we have uh, finalized a deal with Philippines on, uh, on Brahmos. So Philippines has actually t overtaken Vietnam true, in some ways. True, true. In fact, uh, you know, I, you've led me on to my next question, but I just want to also give a sort of footnote to your very, very important points. And that is, I remember years ago, with the French presence in the Réunion Islands in the Indian Ocean region, uh, the French say that they are an Indian Ocean power. 
in as much as our presence and the, the toehold provided by the Andaman and Nicobar Islands clearly make us also an ASEAN participant and the fact that the, the minimum distance between the last island of the Andaman Nicobar group and Indonesia is only 40 kilometers. Absolutely. You know, so yeah. that is like Gurgaon to Noida or whatever. Now the point is that we have been doing maritime patrolling in that area, Ambassador, with coordination with our friendly countries in that region. And as part of the Prime Minister's vision of Sagar, that is security and growth for oil in the, all in the region, we have a naval component that helps us enforce the, our own requirement of an exclusive economic zone. Uh, which is what Professor Pant talked about in the case of Vietnam. But also the Navy can be a very important flag bearer for our role eventually in the geostrategic order of at least the Indo-Pacific. And I am quite conscious of the fact that our reach doesn't go into the Pacific, but certainly in the Indo part, including the South China Sea, where our Navy can operate. And a final point, that effective naval presence there can work as a deterrent for China and its ambitions vis-a-vis -vis the Indian subcontinent, particularly put pressure on the Chinese in those areas in the Straits of Malacca, and they can help you ease off the pressure of the Chinese on the Himalayan front. Your view, sir. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, I would just like to revisit Professor Pant's comment uh, about uh, the deployment of naval assets to protect our hydrocarbon interests. Now, uh, let's go back uh, into 2012. There were two statements by our uh, Navy chiefs. The first one was by uh, Admiral uh, Nirmal Verma, uh, who said that uh, deployment is not on the cards, quote unquote, exact language. But intriguingly, in December that year, his successor, Admiral D.K. Joshi said that we will, if required, deploy in the South China Sea to protect our naval interests. Now, what has happened last year, the four ships that uh, were deployed in September last year, were we were signaling very clearly that, as Professor Pan said, we have the capacity now. 2012 was a different year. Yes, absolutely. So yes. that is the big change that has happened that the strategic community of India needs to take note. I'm not a naval expert, but I can understand as a layman, common sense tells me that India has this capacity and that's why we could deploy individually or bilaterally with Vietnam and others uh, or multilaterally, quad, etc. Now, the you mentioned the exclusive economic zone. You know the U.S. John Paul Jones incident that happened off the coast of Lakshadweep. I'm still intrigued and baffled by U.S. motives, and I'm not fully convinced by all the explanations that have come. Now, we would like to agree with the U.S. to the extent, as far as the South China Sea is concerned, because of Chinese uh, aggressive actions and unilateral claims, and the U.S. Uh, sails its ships. And we have sailed our ships also. In Ma, yeah, just, just a quick question. Yes. Does the EEZ allow you to permit or not permit ships to go through the EEZ if they are not exploring economic assets there? They're just passing through. That is the point I think the U.S. was trying to convey exactly. when its ships sailed through the uh, Lakitiv Islands. Uh, yes, uh, uh, not to carry explosives and prior consent. These are the two points that India gave in its vote when we agreed with the, uh, uh, with the UNCLOS. But, uh, well, Canada, Australia are allies of the U.S. Mm. The U.S. also has uh, uh, also questions there, as they call it, exaggerated maritime claims and exaggerated claims of the exclusive economic zone but they do not sail in their waters without consent. That yeah. answers your question to some extent. Yeah, I so I'm baffled. Uh, what kind of message are we giving? Uh, so, so therefore, our presence in the South China Sea also has a lot to do with our own partners. The United States, 
Britain had a task force last year, as you know, I Queen know. Elizabeth. France, of course, and perhaps Germany also deployed. So if others can be there, we'd better be there. It's, it's very close to our shores. Well, very well made, point, well made and well taken, sir. And Professor Hachpant, now you see the US is now getting set to organize the world's largest international maritime exercise. I think it's called RIMPAC. That is essentially to look at the rim of the Pacific and all other connected areas. And this is going to obviously see uh, between end of June and August a certain amount of naval activity which will involve close to, I don't know, more than a dozen countries or more. And uh, I want to understand, is this going to ratchet up tensions more between US and China? Because clearly China is not going to be quiet about it. Uh, no, and I think Chinese now increasingly make it imperative uh, or very uh, visible their displeasure whenever uh, certain such things happen. So, so either we are going to see uh, activity by Chinese fighter jets very close to Taiwan because Taiwan has become a symbolic uh, uh, point of contention. Uh, it has been, but now it has taken a different role uh, altogether. But I, but I, 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 I do think you know this. Uh, this great power contestation that we are witnessing, both Americans uh, and American uh, uh, presence there mm. and Chinese pushing back, mm. is actually causing you know, the great, this great degree of consternation in ASEAN. Mm. Because ASEAN, uh, whole sense of its identity, mm. what based on this fact that they, can, they, that they were able to successfully manage uh, US and China for a very long time, mm. those times are coming to an end. So I think a lot of these conversations that we are now having are about the future direction of ASEAN member states. And the point that you made earlier, which is I think quite striking, that how uh, India is now increasingly making this point, that India is not an outsider to ASEAN. Absolutely. India doesn't have to be invited to Southeast Asia. India is organically linked to Southeast, Southeast Asia. And that is not, not only because of what, what you talked about, you know, th that are uh, uh, distances. But if you look at, for example, what we are doing with BIMSTEC, you know, Thailand and Myanmar becoming a part of India's immediate neighborhood, not extended. We are giving us, uh, we are signaling that we are part of Southeast Asia through uh, Myanmar and Thailand. And right. so therefore, uh, for us, we, we don't have to be invited. And therefore, for China to say India is an extra regional player uh, in that part of the world uh, is unsustainable. We are, we are there and we will continue to be there in a big way as our capacities expand and as our interests expand. So I think that's the message that Indian Navy's presence is increasingly giving to the region. And by working closely with like-minded countries, I think that's a message we can uh, even more forcefully convey. Ambassador Saab, last question to you. Uh, just briefly, uh, China has been doing a lot of underwater activity in all those waters in ASEAN and closer to India. India is now also looking to start that activity. You earlier talked about satellite navigation related information do you think more and more this is going to be the area for not just trade and geopolitical confrontation but a naval confrontation which will draw india more and more into the region short god, answer god forbid i hope it doesn't happen but uh, there is a uh, talk of uh, uh, underwater drones and by the way, with the United States, intriguingly, the first transfer of technology agreement in the public domain was about airborne drones in the uh, last yes. uh, 2 yes. plus 2 uh, meeting. So that answers your question. So that will increase our capacity, give us access to new technologies to work with countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, Sabang Port. Um, just by the way, uh, talking about the exclusive economic zone, the Philippines made a statement recently that uh, the Indian ships sail there. And as Professor Pan said, everybody is sailing there, uh, despite claims and counterclaims. And if you have the capacity, you are a regional player going beyond the Indian Ocean, Absolutely. at least to the South China Sea. So right. these capacities will help us, no end. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your inputs. It's very clear that as far as Southeast Asia is concerned and the South China Sea, our presence is now there. It doesn't need to be something we need to apologize for. And our Navy will help us play a much bigger role there. And for that, perhaps another discussion. Thanks for watching and thanks for your input. Until our next episode, goodbye.